Well, that song Southern Eyes, Mr. Glenn Campbell had on this radio show, oh, maybe about 10 years ago or eight years ago, he was calling in from a hotel room in Tennessee, and um, I know he was a great guy, a great guy to work with, I'm sure, or interesting person, Charlie? He was a, he was a great guy. When I worked with him, uh, he uh, was recorded, I think he was, I don't remember the label that we did this for, we recorded the record at Capitol. And we recorded 16 songs in one night. And I flew up to uh, Lake Tahoe to meet with him, and he wanted to record with his band. So uh, we, we rehearsed Southern Nights, and, and we, we rehearsed it on a stage where he was performing. And uh, he, he, he was a great guitar player. He had this 12-string guitar. And he actually came up with that lick, that down, 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 down. He came up with that lick. But when he laid that lick down, I came up with the bass line, which he loved, which was down, 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 down. It was sort of like where you didn't play the downbeat on a, it just had like a feel. And then uh, the, the kid who wrote, the, uh, actually David Page's son, uh, uh, Marty Page was a famous arranger. His son, David Page, who was in the group Toto, mm -hmm. he played piano. Uh, he played piano. I'll never forget this. He walked into the session, and um, he, he walked in uh, just nonchalantly. He walked over to the piano, and he looked at the piano parts. He sat down, his eyes, and, and he, he started to look at the parts, and he started to practice them. Because normally they would do these things with head arrangements, but I would write out the parts. But Glenn noticed, had a lot of energy, didn't he? Glenn, Glenn had a lot of energy. One of the cool parts about the record is running through that record, through the whole record, was the piano playing. Dun, 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 was playing Put Another yeah. Nickel in. Dun, Tom, dun, this is a great dun, show. Dun, dun, well, this is the best show ever. But I, I want to throw something so you, into the mix. Excuse before me, I just want to finish this, you see, you think I'm a good arranger. I was a, I was a good copier or a good thief. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I just want to add a little tidbit about Glenn Campbell. Mm -hmm. uh, way before Charlie did this thing, with Glenn, you know, uh, Southern Nights. Glenn Campbell was in a group called The Champs, and they had the record Tequila. Wow. And we, we were touring with them up in Canada. Now, they had Dash Crofts on drums, and they had Jimmy Seals playing it, and, uh, playing with them, and uh, that became Seals and Crofts, and also Glenn Campbell was with them, just to uh, throw that in. Wow. Wow. Well, this is just, just you know, amazing stuff. Just before that, you played Lou Christie's Lightning Strikes. Um, Lou is a, 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 he's a great artist. He's been on this show many times, thanks to Jim Petrek. And, and, and you have, a, I know, quite a few stories, but one specific story about Lou Christie that comes to mind is? Well, uh, how, I, how I actually got to, uh, to record Lou Christie was through Harriet Wasser. Harriet is, her, her name pops up with, with people back, Bobby Darren, Bob Crew. Uh, she was working for Bob Crew when I, when I met her. But she knew everybody, and she connected me with Lou Christie, and at that point, Wes Farrell, who, who, whose company he, he, was, uh, uh, he was signed to. When Lou wrote uh, Lightning Strikes, he wrote it for the first session I did for him, and I, didn't, I told him that the song wasn't finished. I wanted him to finish the song. I said, I like this, I didn't like this, I want you to do this. He went home and he wrote it again for another session, and he came back, and it still wasn't right. And the last time he, he, he when, we, when we songs. made the record for MGM, he wrote the song. The song yeah, so was the one we recorded. It and it wasn't until he wrote that line. She gives me a sign that she wants to make time. I can't stop, no, I can't stop. Lightning struck. I knew we had the record. Yeah, we Big, great, great hit. Great record. Absolutely. Let's talk about the, your fantastic book you wrote with Tom Austin called uh, Another Season, Jersey Boy's Journey with the Four Seasons and Beyond. And uh, um, what did Frankie Valley tell you about when you were writing this book? Any specific words of wisdom or advice? Well, when I finished it, I sent Frankie a copy. And last time I spoke to him, he said he was chipping away at it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Tom, you want to share uh, 
uh, a significant moment from the book, as you you said, you well, had Charlie they, on the phone for many yeah, hours a day. Oh, gee, right? we put we we put our time in on writing that book, but. Charlie was so critical of getting all the details correct. That was what I was so impressed with. You know. one, of, one of the interesting things happened okay, as sure, we no problem. got near the end of writing the book was Charlie said to me, Excellent, I want you to go and see if we can get some uh, comments from different people. And one of the people I uh, uh, called up was Connie Francis. And Connie and Charlie are, are very close friends. Uh, Connie said to me, you know, she said, Tom, she said, uh, you know, I could be driving in my car and hear six Charlie Colillo records in a row. She mm -hmm. said it was unbelievable. Uh, he, they used to play, Charlie and Connie used to play accordion duets at Arts High School in Newark. They mm -hmm. go back that long. But everybody, um, Al Cooper, of course, was Charlie's business partner on movies and television things. But Al Cooper was our guitar player in the Royal Teens. He got his start with us. And Charlie, who haven't you worked with in this business? <laughs> I mean, you know, with like you know, I Sinatra, never, Springsteen. I, I, I never worked Sinatra. with. I never worked Bobby with Dean Martin. Dean Martin. Wow. But but I I but I was I was um, hyped to work with Martin. I was recording Frank Sinatra, and he was doing a show in Westbury with Dean Martin. So I got a call from Dorothy, and she said, the boss wants to see you. Can you come out to the show? So I went out there, uh, and before the show started, she came and got me, and I went backstage. And um, Frank opened the door, the door of the dressing room. There were about 20 people there. And he, had a, he didn't have a shirt on. He, had, he just had his tuxedo pants. And he looked at the people. He says, he says, come on, I want you to meet my friend, Dean. So we went into another room. We went to this bathroom, probably was about the size of this. And Dean was in front of the mirror fixing his tie like this. So he said, he said, he said, Dean, he says, uh, this is Frank Sinatra now hyping me to Dean Mark. <laughs> Which I, I was, I couldn't, it, it was sort of like, it, I, I couldn't place myself in, in, in the moment. But he's saying, Dean, he said, he said, uh, you, 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 know, you know these hit records, he started to name the hit records, he said, uh, he said you should get Colello to do your, do your records. He says, he's writing arrangements for me, but you should get him to make your records. But I never got a chance to work with him, nor uh, Elvis. Elvis died. I, I was up to do a record with him, and then he died during that period. Uh, one of the interesting... About, uh, yeah, I, I was just going to say something, you know, talking about Frank Sinatra. When Charlie was doing the Watertown album uh, for, for Bob Cordio, uh, excuse me, for Frank Sinatra too, uh, everything was said. Ch Ch how many how many instruments you have on that session? There are only about sixty, maybe sixty musicians, right? And Charlie, uh, according to what he shared with me, was sweating it out because yeah. Sinatra was going to come in and sing all this stuff. Charlie had never done a session with Sinatra before this, but Sinatra was one of his idols. Charlie gets up on this conductor stand, maybe two feet off the ground. The band starts in monstrous playing, and all of a sudden, Charlie feels a tug on his pants. When this happens, the band sounds like a, a, a balloon. The air was let out of it. And who's standing behind Charlie but Frank Sinatra, Sinatra. saying, pretty good, kid, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> wow, some great matter. Yeah, because all this stuff is in the book, so. Charlie, about the story of Shirley Ellis, uh, the name of the game. You want to share a moment about your relationship, or you're just working with Shirley Ellis? Well, as that was the first record I ever produced. Uh, I was making Four Seasons records, and uh, I was the drummer who played on the Four Seasons records was Buddy Salzman. Buddy Buddy played on most of the hits, and as I was becoming successful, Buddy said to me. He said, Charlie, he said, there's four stages to your career. Who's Charlie Colello? We got to get Charlie Colello. What we need is a young Charlie Colello. And whatever happened to Charlie Colello? <laughs> <laughs> and he also told me something else. Uh, and then I'll get to the, I'll get to the, uh, the Shirley Austin. He, he said, when they want you, they'll pay whatever you ask. When they don't want you, you can't work for them for nothing, which, was, which is, is very true. And while I was in that 
period of you got to get Charlie Colello, the guitar player who was playing on the on the Four Seasons records, Al Gorgoni, introduced me to Al Gallico. Mm -hmm. Al Gallico signed Shirley Ellis and got the deal with the, with Capitol Records, and then he called me to come in and record Shirley. Now, when I heard the name game, I listened to the song being played on the piano, and they wanted to make a record on it. And I'm saying to myself, what am I going to do with this? The bananas and bananas and go. <laughs> I, I didn't really understand the song. So I took it home, I recorded it, and I figured out what I wanted to do with it. And I went into the studio. Uh, th this doesn't happen anymore. I went into the studio at 2 o'clock. We recorded four songs on the session from 2 to 5. From 5 to 5.30, I doubled the background singers. 5.30 to 6 o'clock, Shirley sang all her parts. She's a great singer. From six, from six o'clock to seven o'clock, I mixed the record, and then we cut acetates. Now, those of us that are in the business for a long time, remember those were those old 78s? And we sent them to Gallico. I had an appointment with Andrew Oldham, who was at that point managing the Beatles, at, at Warner Brothers. I went and took the meeting, got in my car. It was now nine o'clock. I'm driving through the Lincoln Tunnel, on my way to the Jersey Turnpike, I turn the radio on, and the name game is on the radio that night. <laughs> I'm listening to it. I made the record, what, se I started to make it seven hours earlier, and it was on the radio that night, and I'm listening to it, and I said to myself, I, I think I got a little bit too much bass in the mix. <laughs> Here it is, a little bass in the mix with the name game, name of the game. That's amazing. Shirley, 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 Bo Burley, Bo Nana, Bo Burley, Be Fine, Bo Merley. Shirley. I never did church. Lincoln, Bo Lincoln, Lincoln, Bo Bingham, Bo Nana, Bo Bingham, Be Fine, Bo Mingham. Lincoln.